Friends, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I want to welcome you to this online service of worship for October 9th, 2021 for Riverside United Church, an affirming community of faith in London, Ontario. If you're watching this video on the day of its release, happy Thanksgiving weekend to you. I hope your weekend is, is filled with laughter and love as we give thanks for the abundant harvests that are in our world. If you live somewhere else in the world, happy Canadian Thanksgiving to you. If you'd like to give a special offering during this season of Thanksgiving, I want to invite you to, to visit our website. It's there that you can click on the Donate Online button on the upper right-hand side of the page. And there you can go to our, our Give Point page if you click once again through to that Give Point page. And you can select Thanksgiving for your special donation. Many thanks for your generosity and the generosity of so many others as we continue to do the work of sharing God's message of hope and love in our community and around the world. Today we begin a new sermon series. Take up your cross, a study in discipleship from Mark chapter 10. The call to discipleship is an important one. It's also one that is misunderstood. The life of Jesus, particularly the encounters that he has in Mark chapter 10, offer us a glimpse of what life can look like, what our world can look like, when we do that heavy lifting together. And so as we open our service in song, may God speak to us today and draw us toward the light of a better tomorrow. Let's listen for God's voice as we begin our service in song. broken like the first morning blackbird has spoken like the first bird praise for the singing praise for the morning praise for them spring Our scripture reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, from chapter 10. In the passage, we hear about an encounter that Jesus had with a man who had a question about eternal life. Jesus' answer is illuminating. It offers us a window into what a life of discipleship, a life guided by God's grace and love, how it should begin. Many thanks to Debbie Hickling for reading this passage of Holy Scripture for us today. Today's reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 to 31, and is from the Common English Bible. As Jesus continued down the road, a man ran up, knelt before him, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to obtain eternal life? Jesus replied, Why do you call me good? 
No one is good except the one God. You know the commandments. Don't commit murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. Don't cheat. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he responded, I've kept all these things since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him carefully and loved him. He said, you are lacking one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But the man was dismayed at this statement and went away saddened because he had many possessions. Looking around, Jesus said to his disciples, It will be very hard for the wealthy to enter God's kingdom. His words startled the disciples, so Jesus told them again, Children, it's difficult to enter God's kingdom. It's easier for a camel to squeeze through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter God's kingdom. They were shocked even more and said to each other, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them carefully and said, It's impossible with human beings, but not with God. All things are possible for God. Peter said to him, Look, we've left everything and followed you. Jesus said, I assure you that anyone who has left house, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, or farms because of me and because of the good news will receive 100 times as much now in this life, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and farms with harassment, and in the coming age, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. May the Spirit bless us with wisdom and wonder as we ponder the meaning of these words for our lives. And friends, let us pray. O creative God, source of all beauty, you give light to the soul. Open our hearts as we listen for your word. Open our minds as we dream with you. Reveal your life-giving truth that comforts and disturbs us through Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, as we begin this new sermon series, let's begin by attempting to define the word discipleship. The great biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann says that discipleship has to do with aligning oneself with what he calls the neighbor script. In other words, discipleship is about aligning ourselves to the script that invites us to do as Christ commanded us to do, to love our neighbors as ourselves. It's for this reason that Brueggemann suggests that the work of discipleship is never finished. Why? Because the world is always pulling us back into other narratives. Narratives that seek to minimize pain and silence those who are in pain. Narratives that place the privileged at the center of the story while simultaneously pushing other voices to the sidelines. It is, as they say, a tale as old as time. And so, Discipleship, according to Brueggemann, is a twofold task. One, becoming aware of how deeply we are chained to those other narratives. And two, discovering that when we live a life according to the neighbor script, we are really living our lives in the way that God willed us to be. It's what we were created for. Brueggemann suggests that the conversation always has to begin with, and, and this is an important concept as we begin this new sermon series, the conversation always has to begin with pain, he says. What pain do you have? Where does that pain come from? 
If we're innocent enough to say, I don't have any pain, then the question is, who do you know that has pain? Or perhaps more importantly, the question is, do you think that your actions and investments are causing any pain for anyone? Now, these are not easy questions to ask ourselves, particularly for those of us living comfortable lives here in North America. If we look closely at the Bible, we will see that there is a huge bias in the biblical narrative of taking pain as the primary language of human possibility. Pain can drag us down, but it can also lead to transformation and new life. The pain depicted in the scriptures is always, in Brueggemann's opinion, privileged pain. Pain that is rooted in the disparity between rich and poor. Think about it. Think about all the stories. God hears the cries of the Israelites who are enslaved under the rule of the Pharaoh. And God responds to that pain and delivers them. Then when they're free from that pain, living without the bondage of slavery, they begin to neglect the neighbor script, as so many do. Their privilege causes them to neglect the other. And they, on some occasions, become the oppressor. God then calls them back from that, saying to them, remember Remember that you were once slaves in the land of Egypt, and the pendulum swings back toward the neighbor script. The whole narrative that connects the, the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament is one that seems to paint the picture of God's people neglecting God's script and then coming back to it, neglecting it again and coming back to it again. And of course, the gospel narrative is a story where Jesus, God's word made flesh, shows us what it means to truly align ourselves with the neighbor script through our living. Well, that brings us to our first encounter in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 10. It should come as no surprise that God's neighbor script, according to the gospel stories, comes with perhaps the worst marketing slogan ever created. Take up your cross and follow me. The marketing slogans of this world are, are generally designed to do one thing. Keep us thinking that we're at the center of the world's story. They're designed to, to keep us living in our small worlds rather than opening us up to the larger possibilities that God longs for us to see. The slogans of this world are designed to keep us on the surface, prevent us from going to a deeper place, a place that might drastically transform our world for the better. They want us to believe that life is simple and easy. No need to make any drastic changes in your living. Just buy this smile cookie and everything will be better, right? Buy this cola and suddenly the world will be singing in perfect harmony. With all the messages we hear in this, our world, it should come as no surprise that the man who came to Jesus in Mark chapter 10 thought that the life of discipleship was somehow going to be easy. The man in the story runs up to Jesus and asks him what he must do to obtain eternal life. He kneels before him, asks that question, at first glance, it appears as if he's going to get off easy. Jesus says to him, well, you know the commandments. Don't commit murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't give false, te false testimony, he says. Don't cheat. Honor your father and your mother. Simple, right? But that's not it. Jesus has more to say. In fact, I'd like to picture this next part of the story in a very specific way. I picture Jesus dressed, sorry to those of you who are younger who may not get this reference. I like to picture him like television's Columbo in a long trench coat, turning to the man just as he thinks he's off the hook and saying to him, just one more thing. You're lacking one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. 
Those more words must have hit the man like a ton of bricks. Or more fittingly, they must have hit him like a heavy cross placed on his shoulder. All the riches you've built up, give them away. The friends you've made, the social capital that you've been accumulating in your life, toss it aside, join me as we build a new world together. Now, I was taught in Sunday school to look down on this man, to see him as weak and self-centered. But the truth is, we're all like this man. So many of us have turned the other way when faced with the challenge of discipleship. Like the rich man in this passage from Mark's gospel story, we have all had numerous moments where we walked the other way, saddened because we have too many things we just can't let go of. We've all had those moments where we've looked down at God's neighbor script, so to speak, and decided to go the other direction, to write a new story, one that's more favorable to us, Far too often when God's script tells us to do something, we end up doing the opposite, or at the very least something easier. Thankfully, God's neighbor script, Christ's take up your cross slogan, still finds its way into our self-consumed and divided world. And followers just as flawed as us find a way to follow that script. Some of you who are part of our Riverside congregation will remember a few years ago when the Reverend Bill Golderer, the founder of Broad Street Ministry in Philadelphia, came to visit us for a weekend at Riverside. Bill shares a story of how his work with Broad Street Ministry changed just months after they began to worship as a new community of faith. The encounter he and the other people who were in worship that particular night where everything changed what they had with a homeless man in Cedar City, Philadelphia, transformed them from a simple worshiping community to something much more in the years that followed. When the Presbytery of Philadelphia handed Bill the keys to an aging church building just steps away from City Hall in Philadelphia, a building that was once home to a thriving congregation that at the turn of the century had dwindled in membership, and was forced to close his doors. Bill and his team, well, they weren't sure what they were going to do. When they launched the ministry, they they did the predictable and somewhat expected thing, the honorable thing, I suppose. They held worship services on Sunday nights. The preaching, as you might expect, was top-notch, and the music was amazing. It didn't hurt to be located across the street from the University of the Arts. There were some talented musicians living in the community. Then one night, everything changed. Midway through one of their evening services, a homeless man walked in the door and took a seat in the sanctuary. The stench of the man was certainly off-putting, but the worshiping community did their best to tolerate the smell, and the service went on. Then as Bill was preaching, the man fell asleep and began to snore. And it wasn't a gentle snore either. Not one of those cute ones that you hear from a child. It was loud and disruptive. Bill, being the calm and collected speaker, wasn't too phased by the disruption, but he could tell that the other worshipers that were present that night were a little rattled, unsure what to do. And so as he preached the sermon that night, he walked toward the man that was seated and began to speak louder and louder as if to say, hey, we're trying to talk about Jesus here. The man eventually woke up and walked out the door. I think he shared a few uh, words about welcoming others as he left, and I'm sure there were a few expletives in there as well. Now, I can't remember exactly how the rest of the night went, but I do know this. The encounter forced Bill and the rest of the leadership team to rethink what they were doing as a ministry operation in Center City, Philadelphia. It was a moment where they were forced to think clearly about what it meant to align themselves with God's neighbor script. 
in their particular time and place. It was a pick up your cross and follow kind of moment where they had to set aside everything and begin anew. Fortunately, as a brand new community of faith, they weren't bogged down by a long history that often stands in the way of change within communities of faith. They didn't have a complicated and complex decision-making process made up of countless volunteers and committees. The canvas was fairly empty at this stage of their history. And so, with that empty canvas, they began to write a new story for that Presbyterian piece of property on Broad Street. Over the past 15 plus years, they've housed the homeless, advocated for the marginalized of the city, provided countless meals for people of all backgrounds and economic needs, opened a charitable restaurant with a James Beard award-winning chef, and became the first congregation in the Presbyterian Church USA to ordain an openly gay man. The pivot that occurred after Bill's encounter with that stinky, snoring homeless man flipped the script for Broad Street Ministry. It enabled them to see their call of faith more clearly. It helped them to lean into that neighbor script that Walter Brueggemann speaks of. And in doing so, they've led the way for communities of faith just like us. For people of faith just like us. Now, to be clear, not every encounter in our lives is going to be as monumental as that one that occurred at Broad Street years ago. Often those moments are few and far between. The invitation to pick up our crosses often comes to us with great regularity in small, seemingly insignificant ways. An opportunity to show grace emerges when someone close to us makes a mistake. A chance to forgive and show mercy turns up on a less than perfect day. A new challenge surfaces that takes us out of our comfort zone and invites us to sing a new song, so to speak. An imperfect moment with a friend, a family member, or a stranger invites us to embrace the other warts and all. These are all things that when joined together will transform our world. And the good news is they don't cost a dime. The weight of this discipleship work may seem heavy and cumbersome. One can understand how someone might rather write a check and be done with it. The work of the cross isn't easy work. The good news is we don't have to shoulder the burden of the cross on our own. We don't have to pick it up alone. Jesus may have carried that weight on his own, but he also left us with another image. He showed us how to do it together. He showed us what can happen when we see ourselves as one body. As the body of Christ, we can help one another as we respond to God's call to take up our cross. We need not go away distressed by the weight of God's expectations as the rich man did. We can shoulder the weight of this world because we do not have to shoulder it alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. You made this world, you made this world, you made this world. Thank you, thank you. You gave me life, you gave me life. You gave me life, thank you, thank you. You brought this peace, you brought this peace. This peace, you sow these seeds, you sow these seeds, you sow these seeds. Thank you. Your love is everywhere. Your love is everywhere. Open me, open me. Your love is everywhere.
Friends, this concludes our service of worship for today. I pray that in the days ahead, you might listen closely, that you might follow that neighbor script, that the world might be a brighter, more loving place. And friends, on this wonderful Thanksgiving weekend, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of God's Spirit. Go in peace. Amen.